Good morning, everybody. I'm so grateful that you have joined this morning for this little sermon preview. I trust that it will be a, a help to you. And I'd like to open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for this new day, a day filled with possibilities and hope. We ask, Father, that you will continue to heal our world of COVID-19, that it would diminish into something less than the flu. We ask, Lord, that you will be with us today as we go about our business and as we lend our help to one another. We ask your spirit to guide us uh, to cross paths with those we need to talk to, those we need to listen to today. And we ask, Lord, that you will open our eyes that we could see your word and Christ who is behind and beyond it. We ask, Father, that you will open our hearts to receive your word and that we would have a place where your word could grow and multiply and become all in us. We ask that we might be every day more and more like Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you. My name is David Fullen. I'm the pastor of the Jurgens Chapel United Methodist Church and the Drakesboro United Methodist Church, and I want to welcome you this morning to uh, our scripture lesson. I'll be reading the whole lesson and then preaching on half of it, the second half today. So here is our gospel reading. It's John 3, verses 1 through 21. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. <clears throat> Excuse me. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then? Will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, 
but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. For a little review, we said that when Nicodemus came to Jesus that night, Jesus seemed to know that Nicodemus was curious about what Jesus was teaching concerning the kingdom of God. He didn't actually say that, but it was as if Jesus understood from the very beginning. Jesus' first comment seems abrupt, but it fits in with the rest of the story. Nicodemus would have been familiar with the way Jewish teachers like himself spoke of Gentile converts to Judaism as starting life anew, like newborn children. Converts to Judaism were said to become as newborn children when they were baptized to remove Gentile impurity, born of water in Christian baptism clarifies for Nicodemus that Jesus is speaking of conversion, not a second physical birth. To be born of the spirit is another word for that conversion. And Nicodemus asked, how can this be? You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? And then we, we have some special, very special verses from Ezekiel 36, where Ezekiel prophesied about water symbolically for the cleansing of the spirit. And the spirit, the work of the spirit, is what Ezekiel was uh, proclaiming, and it fits in so well here. Let's read those four verses, Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 24 through 27. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries that bring you back into your own land. Let me start again. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. This is the cleansing of the spirit. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And Jesus calls it the new birth, to be born anew. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws. And he today is doing this very, this, this very work in our lives and in the lives of many others who are ex exploring Christ. So Jesus meant converted by the Spirit. We are converted by the Spirit. And we went over some other scriptures, some beautiful uh, scriptures, and came to this conclusion about Nicodemus. We know he should have understood that Jesus meant conversion, but it never occurs to him. He is 
uh, a, a Jew in the elite leadership among Jews, part of the ruling council, the Sanhedrin. And it never occurs to him that someone Jewish would need to convert to the true faith of Israel, that Jesus is the Messiah and is carrying on the true faith of Israel. And then he begins in verse 12, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. And here Jesus separated our religious life into two parts or two divisions, earthly and heavenly. Earthly things are located in this world. Heavenly things belong to the sphere of heaven. Regeneration, another word for this born anew, born again, born of the spirit, re in regeneration may have its roots in heaven, but its daily occurrences belong to our life on earth. Heavenly mysteries like the daily and ultimate functioning of the universe, the changes God worked in relation to his creation by the Messiah's death, the impact and limitations of the Messiah's priestly intercession, or the future rule of God on the earth or through heaven. All of these topics transcend the earth and Nicodemus and our understanding. The contrast here is that if, if Nicodemus would not believe Jesus' testimony when Jesus told him about things that he could partially understand, how could he believe if Jesus told him of things completely unknown to him? Earthly things include the new birth, its nature and necessity. This is what Jesus in verse 11 knew and spoke of and what he had seen and testified to. And in verse 12, the new birth was important in the earthly things Jesus had spoken to Nicodemus. Jesus in this conversation with Nicodemus wanted him to know the true way of salvation, Nicodemus's group of the teachers of Israel could not answer Jesus's question, how can a person be saved? They didn't have a living and dynamic answer for that. And in verse 13, Jesus spoke of his own coming down from heaven and going into heaven under the title, Son of Man a title he applied to himself. This title in John, as in the synoptics, was certainly a messianic title. The title most was used most frequently by Jesus for himself because it carried less political overtones and less uh, loaded theological associations in the Jewish public mind than many other titles that might have been used by Jesus. When Jesus came to earth and spoke of heaven, he had firsthand experience of heaven to share with us. Let's turn now to verse 14 and pick up in the area where we left off last time. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. The people of Israel had been murmuring and moaning and complaining, and God had had enough of it. And he sent poisonous snakes to bite the complainers, and they began to die off. And God told Moses, 
take a bronze snake and mount it on a pole and lift it up so that all the people who see the bronze snake may live and may not die, but they'll understand the kind of venom that they've been speaking against you, uh, Moses, has actually been against me. So Jesus's death is tied from start to eternal life for the one who goes on believing in him. He too would be lifted up on a cross and he would give spiritual life to everyone who believes in him. The divine must behind the lifting up, where he must be lifted up. There was no other way for God and human beings to alter the human situation, except that Jesus be lifted up. He must die. There were no other alternatives, even for God. And then we arrive at verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John is now offering a little sermon uh, using probably what was uh, a collection of Jesus's teachings, he puts together this little sermon. It illustrates the uh, impact of Jesus's words on people. And this one verse has had so much use and impact in our world that it truly has proven itself over centuries to be God's word, God's word to people everywhere. Jesus' death is so important. The author added verse 16. It is the most cited biblical verse in Christendom in the 20th, 21st century. This death of Jesus demonstrated the reality and saving power of the love of God for a sinful world and the human race which lives in that world of sin. And 16 through 18 form one of the best doctrinal summaries of salvation in early Christian literature. Verse 16 has been said to describe Jesus as the agent of salvation. Verse 17 states God's purpose in sending his son and verse 18 describes the divine judgment that can be prevented by believing that is accepting Jesus as God's only son who came to earth to provide salvation expressed in verse 16 as eternal life. John repeats these truths more than once. You'll see them again in 1247. For God so loved the world, followed by, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is God's purpose in coming to us. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. The idea expressed here is that the one who chooses to, to disbelieve Jesus has already been judged and received the sentence of condemnation. Jesus uh, divided humanity into two groups when he came or was sent into the world according to their response to him, those who are being saved and those who have been condemned. The, con the condemnation doesn't come from before they are born, but through their lives they believe they're entering into eternal life. 
And if they refuse to believe with all the opportunities they'll have during their lifetime, then they are condemning themselves to an eternity without Christ, an eternity separated from his life and from his beauty and goodness. And we are entering into a holy communion as a, as a conclusion, really, of this sermon. And I pray that the Lord would be with us as we commune together. And you are most welcome to write me. If you'd like to correspond, you can write me at David F-U-M-C for United Methodist Church at yahoo.com. I would be glad to hear from you and be glad to share this journey with you. Thank you for your kind attention. And I pray now, uh, perhaps let's pray as we go. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the eternal life that you have brought. And even though mankind has, through its behavior over the centuries, mankind has proven their, they prefer darkness to light because darkness hides their evil deeds, at least they think it does. Everything is plain before you, Father. And we ask that you will receive our sorrow and repentance for the bad and wrong things we have done. I pray, dear God, that we would be able to name them in your presence and agree with you that they are bad things and they have nothing and reflect nothing of you. We ask, Lord, that we could agree with you that they are evil and we could part with them and turn our back on that kind of behavior and that kind of evil and join you, Lord, along the road, the narrow road to salvation. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this eternal life that you have won for us through your death and resurrection. We praise you, Father, for the new life that you have given us. And we ask that we could partake of that life, even as we partake of the bread of communion today. Help us to draw closer to you and to take these truths to our hearts today. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you again for joining me this morning. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you until we meet again. Bye.